Payday is so the topic these days. And when I look around this room, this is where it is. This is where we've got so much knowledge in the room. And I promise that we're going to keep the presentation piece of this short <laughs> so that you can take advantage of the people that are around you and continue the networking. Because that's really what this is all about more than anything else is for us to get to know each other. And we have an amazing group here of people and companies represented. And we're really privileged at YesWare to be able to count many of you as customers and partners. And again, just great to have you here. For those of you that don't know, YesWare is a sales solution for salespeople. And we use data help to help salespeople know who to call, who to contact, when to contact them, and help them with what to say and to be more effective at, at sales. We have, thankfully, here today, Bobby from New Relic, and most of you know a little bit about New Relic. And Bobby manages uh, sales enablement and training for New Relic, and is amazing the explosive <coughs> growth that, they're ha that they are having right now. And Bobby responsible for 20 to 30 new hires that are coming through the door every single month. So we're going to hear a little bit about that. He and Mike Kalen, who's the director, so let me tell you, Bobby first, his background, was at Success Factors, the first SMB rep at Success Factors when they were small. How many? 70 employees. 70 employees, was a top performer for a number of years, then went over to New Relic, did the same thing at New Relic, then, then they asked him to go ahead and run the sales enablement and training for New Relic. So really quite the story. Uh, Mike Kalin is the director of sales for Yesware, and Mike also was a uh, second startup. One of the startups prior to Yesware was acquired by NetSuite. Mike was a top performer there, went and opened an office in London, D is top performer at Yesware, and came to open the San Francisco office. Mike knows how to pick the location, <laughs> so we can thank Mike for this. And before I have the two um, just kind of take the conversation, I want to thank our sponsors tonight. We have Infer. Where is Nate and the Infer team in the back? And for those of you that don't know Infer, amazing tool, predictive lead scoring to help close sales. So really glad to have you guys. Also to count you as a partner, we use Infer, believe in the, you guys greatly. And LinkedIn. Do I need to tell anybody what LinkedIn is? <laughs> what do we all kind of know? So thank you. And with that, I'll let you two take it away. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. And thank you again, everyone, <clears throat> for joining tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going we're gonna to get right into things and uh, try and keep this quick so you guys can get to the cocktails, which is what you came here for. <laughs> um, Hold on, before we do that, because I know how these things kind of work, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to sit, and then all of a sudden, 20 minutes in, you're like, I really wish I was sitting. So there's like a whole section of seats right here. If you want to sit down and not get in everyone's way, let's do that in like 30 seconds. If it not, you're, you're standing, and then you're stuck, and you're no longer close <laughs> to the bar. So I'll give you guys that, that moment of insanity. That's opportunity right now. Yeah. I know what that feels like. Um, yeah, so, it won't be more than an hour and a half, two hours up here. So yeah. 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 <laughs> doors are locked. We've, yeah. locked We've been known to ramble, so just tell us to shut up. <laughs> so, uh, so, Bobby, let's get right into it. Um, uh, Bridget talked about your time at Success Factors. Yeah. And uh, you came over to New Relic as a sales uh, person and then uh, quickly got into sales enablement. Um, but why don't you? For everybody in the room that you know hasn't been fortunate enough to partner with you guys, we, we uh, sort of joined in around November. Uh, you were there many months before that. Uh, maybe you could just paint the picture for everyone when you joined New Relic around uh, 2011. Yeah, um, so um, I was fortunate enough to have been through a really successful um, process at Success Factors. Um, for those of you guys who ever get that chance, I recommend taking at least six months off. Um, I took a year off, it was fantastic. And um, after that point, I thought, you know, I want to find a, a fun company, something young, something vibrant. Um, and I, I came across uh, across New Relic, and we were doing this thing that every company, I think, wishes they could do, and we were, we were printing money. Um, we had a product that was very easily adopted, um, and 
we literally had a process at the time, which was, look, if people don't reach out in the next four, four emails, not even four voicemails, not four phone calls, not four meetings, in the next four emails, don't worry about them. Just go to the next lead. Um, and we were making ridiculous deals. And, but we were only about 20 employees, right? So it wasn't like 20 salespeople. We were about a sales team of like five. And um, that's kind of how we started. And we, we, we grew from this, from this idea of um, we want people to love the product. And we don't care if they love the sales rep. That's not the objective. The objective is the product. And I, I learned a new motion when, when I got here. And it was different because at Success Factors, what we had to do was we really had to talk about the psychology of the sale. I really had to, like, twist your arm to kind of make you do something. And we were different. And the thing that we were doing different was we were genuinely focused on trying to help people. And we had this really just amazing growth of how can I take what you came here for and show you how to get something better for it. And we rode that. We rode that ride. And we rode it for a good year and a half. And we were at the time probably about $25 million. We literally, when I got there, we were about a million. Wow. <laughs> Mike Joe? the beat. Is that me? Okay. I won't Forward. talk about revenue anymore. <laughs> <laughs> revenue. Stop <Stop-up. laughs> um, So we were, we, were, we were less than a million dollars when I got there. We were about $20 million and there was this opportunity where they said, hey, you know, we're, we're looking to finally expand and it wasn't we were going to hire one or two people. Like they were going to do the classic injection and success and you know, what do you want to do here? And I thought, well, I want to do what every salesperson wants to do, right? I want to, I want to lead a team. I want, to, I want to be the man. And they said, you know, we've got something different for you. And they painted this picture of this idea of somebody that's close to the business and they're close to training. In my case, I own training. And they're the in-between. And, and we want to take this from this really fun, cool idea of a company and really see what it's made of. And there was like this turning point of, Every, everybody out there, and you guys are probably seeing this in a lot of your own companies, and I know I saw it at Success Factors, and that was you have that point where you have a really cool idea, but now you got to de- decide, do you want to make a good company? And we went from an idea to a, real, to, a, to a company. And at that point, it was from the ground up, let's build training. Let's, I, let's figure out not how do we just get people to say yes, but how do we actually understand people? And that's where I came in. Well, let's talk about that transformation a little bit. So um, you were printing money, you were you know, shooting fish in a barrel, deals were coming up, you were closing them within two weeks. Sounds so good. Uh, that's people, how we people, do it too, don't we? Yeah. That's, that's, that's how we all do it. You guys all know. I mean, that's how it we're is. We're tracking all of you, so. Uh, and then you you were a top performer in and then you go into this sales enablement role. Yeah. And you have all these uh, ideas you were talking to me about. To, you know, We were lucky enough to become a partner of you guys. And about um, what was going to need to change. You started. You went from inbound into outbound. You started doing a lot more prospecting. You had to go and start to find those deals. And getting into sales enablement, you realized that you couldn't just you know train to go through a process and close the deal anymore. You actually have to. You're going to have to change up things a little bit and, and teach sort of how you go out and find deals, uh, connect with people. And you had a lot of ideas that you wanted to start floating to sales enablement. You were hiring three to five people a month. Those were the good days. Three to five people a month. And then, uh, and then Hillary came in, and she blew everything up, and she said, we're going to inject steroids into this hiring process. We're going to hire 25, 30 people a month. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the research that you were doing leading up to her joining, the ideas that you had that you wanted to implement, and then perhaps uh, you told me a really interesting story about your experience with her and how that all changed in a, in a meeting. That, uh, yeah. when she has to present what sales enablement was in New Relic. So I think you asked a couple of questions. Keep me honest if I lose track of them. Um, so I think, a, I think a part of that is, you know, as, as we were growing, I saw something that was happening, and that was we were changing our motion. I'm just curious, how many of you guys have ever worked at companies where you started and then like six months later, a year later, two years later, whatever, your motion literally changed? How many of you guys have experienced that? All right, how many of you guys truly liked that? Yeah, that's pretty normal. <laughs> so um, I was seeing this, and I saw this at Success Factors, right? But I, I wasn't in charge of the, let's say, the betterment of, of sales, right? But I kind of consider that my role. I'm, I'm like the, 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 the sheep herder of all this stuff. And so 
I started to pay attention to things. I started to pay attention not to how do we close a deal, right? And that's what most enablement does. That's what most training does. It's just how do you work a deal? How do you close a deal? And that's what everybody does. But what I realized was as I was talking to reps, they were doing something that I didn't do. They were focusing on closing. <laughs> Sounds crazy. They were focusing on closing, and I didn't focus on closing. I focused on literally building relationships. Now, keep in mind, our sales cycle is like 12 days, right? Yeah, no shit. 12 days. <laughs> 12 days, we're averaging 60 transactions per quarter, per rep. We get more transactions in one quarter than our biggest competitor does in a year. We average more transactions in one year than the entire industry does combined. So we are flying at a million miles an hour. And if you're doing that, do you honestly pay attention to the pulse of your buyer or do you just keep doing the motion? Most of us are going to keep doing the motion. And so I tend to think differently. And so what I, what I realized was, wait a second, if we're going to go from here to here, we can't do that same thing. And I began to pay attention not to what the, not to what the customers were doing, but to what my reps were doing. And I started to realize that the reps that were succeeding, they were just naturally connecting. And I'm sure most of us in our career, like we've seen these people that are just like, they can go into a room and they sort of just own the room. And you're like enamored with everything they say. And you walk away going, I could never do that. We had those reps, but then the other reps, they were walking into a room and they were just like getting all up in their own way. And I realized that I'm like, well, wait a second. And my entire career, I'd always been told, you know, Bobby, you're really special. You're, you can do things differently. Nobody thinks like you. And, you know, as good as an ego boost that is, I don't, that doesn't make me actually feel good. And so what I thought, what I realized was I'm special to my family, but I'm not special as a salesman, right? And there's things that I could teach. Only your mom was telling you. It was, thank you, thank you. It was really only my mom. Um, and so what I realized was, what if we can do it differently? Like, what if the key to the game wasn't closing people that were here to buy. Because that's what we've been doing. And I shared this with you when we were kind of talking before, and that is, I look at things sort of on a bell curve. Um, hopefully we all know what a bell curve is. And if you think about a bell curve, um, you have three classifications of buyers, right? You have your, your A buyer. We love A buyers, right? Why? Because the A buyer comes in with an agenda to spend some money. It's you versus the competition, then someone's winning. Sadly, that's not all sales. And in our capacity, I'm just kind of curious, you know, from in your world, like, what do you think an A buyer is? Like, what percentage of, of yes, where, even your career, like, how, what percentage of, of are A buyers? Man, it's small. Uh, small. 10, 20%. 10, 20%. Is that what we kind of would agree with? 10, 20%? All right, it's typically, it's typically what we see. So the other side of the spectrum are the C buyers. These are the waste of time leads, right? These are the people that you call 75 times. Okay, nobody calls 75 times anymore, I get it. So we send 75 emails, and <laughs> we call once, we call, we call yes, once, sir. we tell our boss, we call 10 times. Is that yes, right? Sir. <laughs> right, so we do that, and we go through this motion, and that's like, you know, maybe 30%, 40% on the high side, but that still leaves like this crazy void in the middle of that bell curve. And those are your B leads. And what I started to realize was, if we're going to actually take this on, we don't need to focus on how do we close the people that are going to buy something. We need to figure out how to get these people that are on that fence to become A's to move quickly. So how do we do that? We got to be quicker, faster, better at making connections, making engagements. And so to your point, I sat, sat down with Hillary. Hillary's brand new. She doesn't know me. Um, how many of us, just curious, how many of you guys know Hillary? Okay, so oh, Hillary's—that's why they're sitting in the front row. Yeah. Um, so uh, Hillary McAdams, she's our chief revenue officer. She was the vice president of sales for for Salesforce. Um, she's the one who was single not single handedly. I didn't say that. She's the one responsible for leading the charge, taking them from let's just say a multi hundred million dollar company to a billion dollar company. So of every company, and I made this joke to her one time, and I said, for every company that you can go to. You chose this podunk company called New Relic. Why? And she gave me an answer, which isn't the point, but she came in and she came from uh, Oracle. She comes from Salesforce. She has emotion. Like she knows what it takes to take a company where we are right now to that next level. And it's, and it's exciting and it's intimidating and it comes with a lot of change and a lot of energy. And so she sat down with me one day and she's like, you know, I, I want to know what sales enablement is doing. And I thought, 
cool. This is my chance. I'm going to show you what's up. And um, I sat down with my leaders and I'm like, I don't know her. Can you, can you give me some guidance? Can you show me? Can you, we do this in sales, right? You go to your champion and you say what? Can you show me what your manager wants to hear? <laughs> wants to hear. All right. So I do that and they tell me and I build, I build my PowerPoint. Of course, I have my facts. I have my plan. I have my strategy. And I get into the meeting. And um, Hillary's doing what? She's looking at her cell phone. She's looking at her laptop. And she's doing everything that we all hate. And I'm like, all right, um, I am totally wasting her time. And she's, you know, she's, she's amazing, but she just, you know, she's that classic, I'm focused here, and then she'll look over you know, above her eyeglasses and kind of just like, any day now, get to the point. And so she's kind of doing that to me, and I'm literally crapping a brick, and I'm thinking, all right, well, what, what do I got to do? And, you know, you get me a pen and a whiteboard, and all of a sudden I turn into a, magi a magician. And she's just like, so I don't understand something the effect of, I don't understand what is it that we're doing. And I'm like, oh, crap. I gave her this big elongated roadmap strategy about how to grow the team and everything we need to do and all the resources we need and the strategy. And what I realized was she was new and had no idea what we were doing, what I was doing. And so I took that moment to whiteboard and outline all the stuff, holy Lord, all the stuff that that we were doing. What were we doing? We were teaching people how to engage. We were teaching people um, not how to... We were teaching people not necessarily how to close business. Mic's off. There we go. Not necessarily how to close business, but how to build relationships, how to build rapport, how to set the tone. Speak really loud. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'll make sure to talk loud. All right. So we, we, we focused on how to set the tone how? Let's turn these off. <laughs> <laughs> microphones are fire. Yeah, fire the microphones. Um, all right, so we really focused. You guys want to use handhelds? We spent yes. all the money on alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> no sound. No sound. You guys want to take a break, actually, and come back. We'll get this sorted out. Uh, all right, we're getting some like, mad interference. Turn your side off. Hold it down. Yeah. Uh, do you have your Mic check. I'll reach him. I'll turn it back on. Someone's gonna have to remind me where I was in that story because I actually I lost. Well, let's let's um so actually let's talk about this from so you had this idea about um, how you were gonna break down the product New Relic yeah. into buyer personas yeah people that had interest in certain types of product and the large that largely was centered around. Um, how they connected with the product emotionally. Yeah. And you had these great ideas and you went to sort of pitch this thing that was a little separate from that, a lot of trepidation to Hillary. And all of a sudden you realize she's not paying attention at all. Screw it. I could probably get fired anyways. Uh, there might be someone really... Such a better synopsis than what I was saying. I was <laughs> for like five minutes. That was perfect. And, yeah. uh, and so um, you started to whiteboard it and you said, you know, fuck it. This is, this is what I need to do. I need to just show what I'm going to put on the table what I need to, to, to prove myself. And you did that. And what I found was interesting is she was really compelled by that. She said, all of a sudden, you know, I get it. So I think yeah. what, what was most compelling to me to hearing you talk about this story was then you had this aha moment <laughs> where it was like, okay, actually someone, the most important salesperson in the company gets what I want to do now. Now I have to go sell it to other people and execute on this. So how did you get from that point where you convinced her in that meeting or had that conversation about what you were going to do and she got it to now go and putting that into motion. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a funny, not a funny ha, ha moment, but like a funny, holy crap moment. Um, so I left that conversation realizing what, what I missed going in. Right. And I realized, okay. Um, I accomplished in a whiteboard in five minutes when I failed for 55 minutes prior to Thankfully, I, I, I salvaged that, and I walked away thinking, I have all these ideas, and they're not normal, right? They're not, they're not, um, they're not that kind of idea. 
Uh, no, I have all these ideas, and they're just they're not what we normally teach people. And here's Hillary saying, we want that. We need that. And I didn't have approval, and I didn't have people telling me yes. And so I sat down with one of, one of, the, one of the guys that I actually work with who's a sales rep, and I'm always telling him, just trust your instinct. Just do this because it's the right thing to do. And he comes to me. He's like, yeah, but my other boss used to tell me blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you keep following what your other boss told you to do. And what happened? He's like, well, I'm not closing any deals. I'm like, all right, we'll start following your instinct because when you listen, you actually close deals. And I'm trying. I, I spend a lot of time teaching people this. And he looks at me. He's, he takes that moment, right? And he goes, if you just listen, she'll, nobody will care and everyone will thank you. And it was kind of that moment where it pushed me over the edge. And I just thought, you know what? I've got, it was, I, I kind of consider it my M&M moment, right? Right? You got one chance, one opportunity. Come on, give me background music. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you get one chance, one opportunity. And if you have that opportunity and you let it slip, like you're going to hate yourself forever. And I just said, fuck it. Right? I mean, who cares, right? I just got this, you know, third round stage funding, hottest company in the freaking Silicon Valley, closing in on all this greatness. Ah, screw it. I'll just go do it on myself. Literally, I went for it. And I just took 25 reps one time. And I said, I'm going to see how this performs. And we had enterprise reps. We had people with 25 years of sales experience. And then we had me. And for those of you guys that are wondering, you know, I've, I've been doing sales for 20 years. So it's not like I just thought of this as an epiphany. It's something I realized that I was doing. And people don't teach this thing. And you guys are probably wondering, what is that thing? Well, that thing is how to engage. Right? How to engage. I do this thing where at the beginning of every sales training, actually I'll do it with you guys because I think it'll be entertaining. Um, for the record, just curious, how many of you guys are in a sales role? Just raise your hands. All right, hands down. How many of you like buying from salespeople? <laughs> <laughs> One person. And I'd be willing to bet you like buying for salespeople, but you like screwing with salespeople. <laughs> <laughs> you like that negotiational fight, right? So, but I think that's funny because I asked that same question in my sales trainings, and guess what? The hand raise is exactly the same. And usually the one person that raises is like my dad, right? Like my dad, he loves to haggle. I hate to haggle. Right? He loves to get the deal. I don't care about the deal. I just want to get the product. Get it done. I'm go home. You suck. And so, <laughs> And what I realized with salespeople is we don't like ourselves. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what we're saying. I don't like a salesperson. I'm a salesperson. So I ask everyone in the class, like, what is it? What's that thing that you don't like? Words come out. You guys tell me if you agree. Just like yes or no. Listening. They don't listen. Yes or no. Yeah. Um, they have an agenda, and I don't like that. Yes or no? That yeah, was a quick yes. Um, they put a lot of pressure on me, and I don't like that. Right? They're always focused on the clothes, and they're not, they're not paying attention to what I need. Okay, now ask yourself, is that exactly what you do in your sales? Some of us. Yes, we have one honest person. So, ordinarily, what we are taught is how to get what I want done. And... Fundamentally, that is not how we want to be approached. It's the reason why we don't like salespeople, but yet we do it back. So what I what I what we teach a lot is look, understand how people want to buy, and do that. Right, treat people the way they need to be treated because they're evaluating a product, and help them on that journey, help them on that path. And the the thing that you can't do is you can't be fake. Um, you, know, you have to be genuine. You have to be real. You have to actually understand what it means to not be afraid of getting told no. I mean, honestly, how many of you guys like being told no? Yeah. One guy. Um, that's weird. So, <laughs> how many of us are more afraid of being told no, though? Right? Totally. Right? There's a fear of no. So what do we do? We, we say what we think they need to hear. When I sat down with Hillary, what was I saying? I was saying what I thought she needed to hear, and I was wrong. Um, I, I went in with a plan because I thought strategically it made sense, and I was wrong. And if I just would have went in it with the whole idea, and I just would have stepped back and thought, she has no idea what I do because she's never talked to me. She doesn't know me. She's never said in my trainings. She has all these opinions on things that aren't happening that I know she doesn't know about. And when I finally broached that, it was like this moment, right? And we teach salespeople that. 
So you you uh, you had this idea. You were clearly gaining momentum behind it. You put it into practice. You're hiring 25, 30 people a month. How do you it, like? No shit. Everybody knows that you need to connect with your buyers. You know, you need to have some rapport. You need to show a little bit of credibility about what you're talking about. But how do you boil that down into two weeks of training? And like, you know, uh, with all due respect, you, you left sales, right? And and a lot of salespeople are saying, probably sitting in the room, like, who the hell is this guy teaching me that I that uh, how to sell? Like, he left sales. He's you're saying that to bring some clothes to the exit. <laughs> So how do you boil that down in two weeks and get people that are in that room to listen to you and then after the two weeks are done to continue that? Um, that's a great question. So I think there's, a, there's, there's layers into it. Um, the first layer is you, you, can't, you can't teach somebody that doesn't want to learn. Um, how many of you, you look pretty young here, so I'm not going to ask. Okay, I'll ask the question. Anyways. How many of you sound teenagers just kids? So, how many of you guys have tried to engage with teenagers? Do they listen or not? The more right you are, the more they reject the opinion, right? Um, I have a 19-year-old brother, and we have that exact same relationship, and he adores me, and he loves me, and I love him. We have a great rapport, but heaven forbid I tell him something that makes sense. He'll just do it out of spite to do the opposite thing. And salespeople are no different. We don't, we don't want to be told, right? But if you come across it by yourself and it just makes sense, then all of a sudden... It makes a change. And so one of the things that we do is we talk about, we, we spend a lot of time telling stories. We spend a lot of time talking. Um, right in the very beginning of class, you know, everybody goes around the room and they talk about something we've all done in training. And that is, um, who are you? Where are you from? Tell me an interesting thing about yourself. And it's totally on PC. And I'm not going to say it because we're like, we're doing this. Um, it's just, um, it's, you know, it's kind of boring. And so I inject some different things in there. And it's, you know, if you weren't here, where else would you be? And I, and, I, and I start to realize that some people, you know where they wouldn't be if they weren't there with me right then and there in their training? They'd be working. Other people would be on a beach. And I start to realize that we have left brain people, we have right brain people. And right brain people are very creative. And by nature, we turn off the right side of our brain so that we become very logical, we become very focused. And everything that we do in sales is about control, true or false. It's about asking open-ended questions, which is bullshit because we ask open-ended questions with a closed answer that we're looking for, right? It is our agenda in full motion. We're saying we are showing, and we know it. It's the reason why we don't like ourselves. And so <laughs> what I teach the people is don't ask open-ended questions with an agenda. Ask an open-ended question that's actually going to help that person, to help that buyer, to get them what they want, to get them to understand whatever the hell it is you're trying to understand. And we go through this process, and we talk about the product. Every one of you has a product. How many of you can actually honestly describe the emotional involvement of your product? Your product manager. <laughs> <laughs> and a product manager, that's great, but the product manager is a developer in hiding. Um, so they are very emotionally connected, right? But salespeople, what do we do? This is what salespeople do, so we're tied. We go in and we talk about this is what it does, this is what it is. And this is why you need it. And while that's accurate in 1990, I want you to think for a moment, and, I and again, I talk about this, right? It's, I want you to think for a moment, in 1990, if you were buying a car, could you go on the internet? No. Could you go to the library and look at a magazine? Yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Be driven. And if you wanted to buy a car, what would you normally do? You'd go ask your dad your uncle or someone who's a car person, all right? Just to be politically correct, your mom. Um, and so you go ask these people, and then to ultimately understand the in and outs of that car, who did you have to buy to? Who did you have to trust? The salesperson, the dealer. All right, let's fast forward. Here we are in 2014. How many of you guys recently bought a car in the last three years? Just curious. All right, cool. So when you guys bought that car, did you get your information from the dealer? Nope. No. Let me tell you what you did, and you tell me if I'm wrong. You went online, you researched it to the umph degree, you asked your friends even though you didn't care about their opinion, <laughs> you went on YouTube and you watched everything possible, and by the time you went on that lot, you made a predetermination that you were going to buy something. And the, the car person comes to you and they approach you. And they say what? 
What do they say every time? Somebody, anybody. How can I help you? And you probably still said what? Just looking. I'm just looking. Okay, so here we are. We live in a software generation. And are we actually approaching people with that use? Or that use is terrible. With that car salesperson approach, making people say, I'm just looking? Or are we actually trying to understand who the hell they are to give them a compelling reason to buy from me? Everyone in society today has information front and center. And if we were approaching people like it's 1990, even though we have modern day technology, well, then the only people you're closing are the aliens. Yeah, so let's talk about that in terms of, we promised a short. Uh, sorry, you can be sorry and I get gone. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up, but uh, talk about the results. I mean, obviously you have a great product, you have a great company, you have great leadership, um, and you've done really big things already. You know, forgetting sales enablement, but talk about the impact you, you really wanted to impact. Uh, you, you rolled out in fur. They helped you segment A, B, C leads. Prior, put some priority around those, and your goal was really to have an impact on closing those B deals. Yeah. So, can you just talk a, just very quickly about the results that you've experienced from this sort of change in model from Hillary on down through the training that you're going to do with your team? Yeah, um, put a little context on that. We we went over the last nine months, actually for that last year. We went from strictly inbound to outbound, 100% inbound, 60-40 outbound, and we went from you know 98% of our sales, literally 98% of our sales force hitting their number over and over again, terribly. Now we're down to about 40 to 60%, which according to the way that I've grown up, if 40 to 60% of your sales force is still hitting their hitting their number, that's insane, right? A lot of enterprise companies are sitting right around five, three, four, five, ten percent. Right? So we're still crushing numbers. We're still doing great things. And so when I look at the success of the program, I'm watching that. And when I look at the reps who are actually successful, every single one of them, they're embracing it. And, and I get it. You can say something and you evangelize. You're like, oh, that makes great, great sense. Right? You're training. You're all excited. You're on a high. And you close deals. And then all of a sudden, 90 days later, you start to forget. And so a part of what I'm doing is I'm going back and I'm reinvigorating and I'm constantly in contact with these reps. And we're seeing success, obviously, because you guys are all here and you wanted to hear me talk, which is really, really creepy. Um, but we're seeing success because we're growing, because we're exploding. And that, and that hockey stick went from this to this, right? We're, we're eight, we, have, we have grown. We were, I, I'm, I'm spitballing. Let's say we were 50 sales reps in January 1. All right, we're literally averaging 25 new salespeople every single month since January 1, and we're still on that same hockey stick. You, you can't have that kind of success and not have the program work. So we're just, just, yeah, because yeah. we're going to start yeah. looking like liars. Yeah, we are already. Uh, liars? Right. Oh, time? Yeah. So uh, we'll open up to questions now, if, if anyone has them. If you prefer just to go straight to the bar, we get that too. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, hi, I'm Bennett from Sales for Startups, and this may be a dangerous question for me to ask. As long as it's not money, we heard what happened when we talked about it. <laughs> well, I say that because we're in the business of teaching startups how to get good at selling. Yeah. But given everything you just said about um, you know information really being available to the buyer before engaging with a, a salesperson, do you think we're approaching an age where salespeople will no longer be necessary? Yes. Can you say a little bit more about it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just went, what? <laughs> yes, okay, thanks. I think that what's happening is people are building better software. And because you build better software, the sales rep doesn't have to convince somebody why they need it. Let's, let's be really clear. Yes, where infer it doesn't matter, right? What, what is every company doing? They're building a software that you can test, play with, and you can make a determination without ever talking to a sales rep. So what's the only reason why they need to talk to you? Price. That's it. So if price is the only reason, and you're not the best, cheapest game in town, then they better like your ass. That's not a joke. They need to like you. You have to be able to connect. I want you to think about any sale that you've ever had in your entire career. I bet you can call that person today. Right, your best sale. And I bet that best sale might not be the one that was worth the most money. And that's a reality, and that's not 
That's not me up here saying, oh, I've stumbled across this fantastic path. No, that is me saying the thing that defines a great salesperson is how they can make that connection. So if you fast forward to your peer question, if software is getting that nimble and information is that prevalent, we can make those kind of determinations that is going to require salespeople to understand who their buyers are, how we connect, how we listen, how we communicate, the tone that we use. I mean, when you guys are talking to your friends, how many of you actually call them versus text them? How many of you use some kind of an email method? Right. I read a statistic the other day from Reuters that said 30% of any communication in business is now being done on the internet or done through email. 75% of the average of business communication is actually being done through email. That's insane. And the reason why that's insane is because 7% of communication is verbal and the rest of it is nonverbal. Last time I checked, email is nonverbal, right? So if you're sending emails today the same way that you would have typewritten a, a letter back in 1990, guess what you're doing the minute you say hi? You're saying, I am that sales guy, right? I don't stand out. People talk about, oh, I got to stand out. I got to jump up and down. No, you have to be genuine. Right? I make a joke in training where I talk about this, and it's totally politically incorrect, but I kind of don't care. So I talk about this, like, if you go up to, a, you go up to an amazing girl at the bar, and you say something really, really bad, it's the last time she's ever going to give you a chance to talk to her. Period. Every time you walk in there, she's never going to let you talk. But if you approach her at a standpoint that actually you don't come across as a creeper, and you're a nice guy, all right, nothing might, you might not get anything from it, but guess what? You've made a friend. And last time I checked, if you make a friend, it increases your chances. So if it increases your chances in life, how in the hell can it not increase your chances in sale? Thank you very much, Bobby. Appreciate you guys. Okay. Um,